Hi everyone, Pastor Jordan here for your Bible study lesson this week. We're going to continue on looking at the book of Numbers. Uh, we're going to skip over a couple chapters to continue kind of with the narrative side of things. Um, but uh, if you haven't jumped on yet, we have our video from last week that you can take a look at. Um, as always, if you need anything, let me know. I'll be glad to help. Um, but I look forward to continuing to go through this today with you. But uh, before we begin, let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for the Old Testament. We thank you for the New Testament. And I pray that you would help show us this morning how it all fits together. Help us show not only uh, the knowledge that we can have from this, of what has already happened, but to see how this applies to us here today. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive it. Lord, that we would want to take the time to be with you in your word today. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Now we pick up here uh, at a passage that's probably very familiar to many of you that you probably did not even know you knew. Um, this is the uh, Aaronic benediction, and if you notice in um, service in the benediction portion, um, myself as a pastor or another pastor you might know will pronounce this blessing uh, upon the congregation. And uh, it's actually, this is where that comes from here back in uh, Numbers chapter 6 and again I, I just kind of skipped over some of these other portions but I really want I did want to hit on this because uh, we, we've all heard it and know it and I'd like to kind of go through it for just a second uh, uh, with everybody and so uh, we're told in verse 22 that God told Moses to speak to Aaron and his sons uh, they are the priests um, and tell them they are to bless the people of Israel by this following blessing and you notice uh, and only a pastor is those can, that can pronounce a benediction or a blessing upon the people as God's uh, spokesman. Um, and so Aaron uh, and his sons did that, whereas you see pastors do that today. Uh, and so, but it's, it's a, these verses are, are such a blessing to us. Um, it's actually one thing that you notice here. Uh, in this, we see this is kind of an all-encompassing blessing. Um, if you look at the little title slide here, this is actually the Aaronic blessing in Hebrew. Um, and if you notice on here, um, if you take out the word Yahweh, uh, which is God, or it might say Adonai, um, here, there are actually 12 words. And uh, you don't see this in the English version, but uh, in the Hebrew version, this has a lot of weight, because remember, there are 12 tribes. Um, so a full encompassing um, of this blessing for, for all of God's people. And also that points to us here today, the blessing of God to all of his people. But again, his name is mentioned time and time again. It didn't have to be, but to reiterate that the, the blessings of God are only because of him. Um, and we can they can be found nowhere else. Um, and so if you look here with me then, um, I do want to go through this uh, a little bit more in detail than we will for the rest of the lesson, but uh, we first see that God says, you know, the Lord bless you. Uh, we think of the word blessing um, as kind of a, an overarching term, it's a general term that we uh, use for, for many different things, uh, where God gives us children, He gives us uh, family, um, he gives us wealth, he gives us land, um, and so we see that it's from all these things that come from God. Secondly, uh, we see that God is the one that keeps us. Uh, we think about keeping, keeping safe. Um, the Bible talk, talks about time and time again how he's our strong tower, he's our refuge, he's our strength. Um, he is the one that we can go to um, for protection. And that will keep us in his perfect protection. doesn't mean that uh, we won't go through difficulties in life, but ultimately in the end he has uh, secured our souls. Um, we see how he you know, to protect his people, uh, leading them to the promised land, but also to us here today. And then you see that the Lord make his face to shine upon you. Now, this is an interesting uh, phrase here. Um, 
And when, when you see somebody, you're speaking to somebody, you want to see their face. You want to see that they're paying attention uh, to you, to what is going on. And we see the, the blessing of God that he actually pays attention to us. He's attentive to, to our wants and our needs and all that we've got going on in our life. Uh, it's that personal aspect of our relationship with him and uh, make his face to shine upon us. You see, kind of, you know, God is light. Um, and so we see that he was graciously shining his light upon us, seeing us, um, answering our prayers, and delivering us. Now also, uh, right after that, we see that uh, he says, the Lord be gracious to you. Uh, I think this reminds us that we have a forgiving God um, who is slow to anger and deals with us in our sin. Um, he has already forgiven the people of Israel uh, for their uh, debacle with the golden calf and for all their future uh, problems. We see that you know if they repent, God will forgive them and he deals with them graciously, although he does not have to. And in our own life, we can see the same thing about how God has dealt graciously with us. Um, normally I save this application portion for the end, but I feel like as we're talking about it, it's helpful here. If you think about Christ, uh, just how gracious God has been towards us as sinners, and we look at uh, how many times that we haven't listened to him, that we've broken his commands, but yet God is still gracious to us through Christ um, to deliver us from our sin, although we do not deserve it. And so we can see quite clearly that there is a blessing in that. Um, and the last thing here, uh, the second to last thing, excuse me, says that the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. Uh, again, God paying attention to us that he would look approvingly uh, upon our lives and that from that, that we would find his favor. Um, and so here we pray that God would see how we are living our life and that he would help us to act accordingly um, we can we see in scripture where God has turned his face away that blessing uh, that loneliness that is felt um, so we, we want God to uh, to lift up his countenance uh, his face uh, upon us and but we also need to make sure that he's not paying attention to us for the wrong reasons it's not uh, turning his face against us. And so this reminds us to live in the light of God and he will look upon us with favor. Not that he will give us everything we want in this life, but um, that indeed true blessing will follow those that follow the Lord. And finally, we see that we pray that in this blessing that God will, will, will give peace. And uh, that word peace is not simply the absence of war. It is shalom. Uh, a sense of wholeness that we get from this. Um, Well-being, uh, health, prosperity, and ultimately salvation. Uh, you know, and I think this, this last word, peace, kind of sums up the rest of it here. Uh, it shows us that, that all of God's gifts bring about this shalom to his people. And I think that one way we need to, to look at this is often we think of being at peace when we get all that we want. But note, we have to look at it in God's light to see how all the ways that God has blessed us reminds us just how cared for that we are. Um, not simply the things that we don't have, but look at what we do have. Look at how God has provided for us uh, in this life. He, how he has blessed us, how he has kept us, how he has made, made his face to shine upon us, how he has been gracious to us, uh, how he has lifted up his countenance upon us. And see how that gives us this peace. But if you notice here, um, after that is over, uh, this last, there's one more verse right after this. It says, So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. You know, and God is claiming ownership over his people. And uh, I want to read this. Uh, I normally don't do this, but I think this, this quote hits the nail on the head. Uh, it's from Raymond Brown in his, his commentary on Numbers. It says, uh, the benediction's conclusion guarantees that peace. Uh, here is in the last verse, so they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. To put one's name upon something was to give it the distinctive stamp or mark of ownership. 
And the Lord has put his name upon the Israelite people as their bountiful giver, as the one that blesses them, as their strong protector, the one that keeps them, as their faithful friend, the one that makes his face to shine upon them, as their forgiving lover, the one that's gracious to them, as their reliable partner, the Lord lifting up his countenance upon them, and as their generous provider, as he gives peace to them, as well as their unique owner. God's people were his treasured possession, and he has resolved to meet their every need. And I think that this is such an encouragement for us. When we hear this pronounced, this blessing pronounced upon us on a Sunday after as worship is ending, that this is true of the people that have come to Christ, that God will indeed bless us beyond all that we can imagine, not in worldly means, but in true godly means. And so I hope that uh, as we jumped into that and that has been uh, helpful for you to understand it but also to to be thankful for that that God indeed blesses us in this way now it's worth mentioning here as we begin in chapter 7 uh, in verse, verse 1 we're told that the, the offerings of the leaders they're given on the day that Moses finished setting up the tabernacle if you go back to Exodus um, we're told that he completed that on the first day of the first month of the second year after the people left Egypt well, Numbers 1 through 6 take place after that time. And so the events of chapters 1 through 6 occur you know, about a, a full month after what we'll see in verse uh, chapters 7 through 9. And um, that doesn't mean there's anything uh, discreditable, discreditable about that. Um, it's just sometimes God uses that as far as emphasis. Um, and so, but here in chapter 7, uh, we actually kind of go backwards just a little bit. And so uh, the tabernacle has been set up. And um, we're told here that uh, there's gonna, this 12-day festival that's happening, that, that, that's happening um, here as the tabernacle has been erected. Uh, and gifts are being brought uh, to be used uh, in the work at, at the tabernacle. We can see uh, chapter 7 really hits home on that. Um, as we mentioned last time, uh, if you remember, the Levites are going to be divided up between uh, between Gershon, Merari, and, and Koath. And uh, we actually see here, if you remember, uh, the different duties. Uh, the wagons uh, for two of those groups and the oxen are brought forward and, and donated and given. Um, there are six wagons, two per tribe, and one ox per tribe to pull those. But if you look in verse 9 of chapter 7, we're reminded that the sons of Koath, he gave none because they were charged with the service of the holy things that had to be carried on the shoulder. Um, and so uh, the chiefs of all the people offered uh, offerings uh, to dedicate the altar. And we're also told that for 12 days, they continue to, to offer things. And you have this formula here. Uh, if you look in verse 12, we see on the first day, uh, Nashon, the son of Amenadab of the tribe of Judah, came and he offered one silver plate, uh, one silver basin, uh, both of each of these full of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering, a golden dish full of incense, a bull from the herd, a ram, a male a year, lamb a year old for a burnt offering, a goat for a sin offering, and the sacrifice of peace offerings, two ox and five rams, five male goats and five male lambs a year old. And this uh, actually repeats with each tribe the next day um, until you have that uh, for every day. But kind of just you know, walking through these things that are given, um, we see the, these fine crafts uh, or wares here. Uh, we see incense is given to be offered uh, in, the, in the, uh, the tabernacle as well as a grain offering because that's where the, the priests you know, got part of their meal. Uh, and then the different sacrifices here, uh, provisions. Uh, and so each one of the tribes is coming and bringing forth this portion um, to dedicate to the Lord. And uh, you see that repeat yet again just to remind that all the people there are on equal footing. Uh and we can kind of see the same thing is true here for us today. We are all on equal footing before the Lord, and uh, we are all to devote ourselves wholeheartedly to him, no matter who we might be. As the 12 tribes uh, represent all of the people of Israel there, 
Um, the same can be true of all of us being on the same footing as, as the church. And so I think this is a reminder to us that we all need to be giving our best uh, to the Lord uh, as we, we dedicate not gifts to an altar, but just dedicate ourselves to him. This also points back again to that being the day when the tabernacle was set up. And we're told when Moses went into the tent of meeting, this is uh, the last verse, verse 89 of chapter 7, that uh, he went in to speak with the Lord, and the Lord spoke to him from above the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, and then in chapter 8, we're, we're given a few verses about the, the seven lamps. Um, if you remember this, the seven lamps that are on the lampstand, um, and we're, we're told that they are to give light in front of the lampstand, and um, shows how Aaron does that. And the reason for that is, if you remember, the showbread that was to be made and laid on that table was in front of that lampstand, and so the light, which would you know point to God, uh, would shine forth on those twelve pieces of bread, which represented the people of God, uh, symbolically reminding that the presence of God is is upon and with the people. Again, the same thing is true with us here today. Um, and we're con- kind of hitting the same topic as we talked about last week. We see the Levites, remember they're set aside for God's purposes in chapter 8, um, and so they are all to be cleansed, um, and the people uh, are to, to lay hands on them, sacrifices are to be made, uh, dedicating them to God's service. And um, we're also told at the end of chapter 8, um, as far as the, the Levites and their their tenure, their duties, um, they are to serve uh, God in, in the temple, um, or in the tabernacle, for twenty from 25 years old until 50. Um, and after that, uh, they won't serve anymore, but they will minister to their brothers in the tent of meeting by keeping guard, but they shall not do any service. And so God reminds them, reminds us of, of what they are to be doing. Again, we see that this uh, is not in chronological order again, but there's not a big deal with that. Now as we go into chapter 9, uh, again, we see the not non-chronology here, uh, that the first Passover um, is to be, excuse me, the second Passover, first after they had left Egypt, uh, is to be done. And we're told that God spoke uh, to Moses in the first month of the second year, which was probably around April. Um, and he reminds them that the people are to keep the Passover the appointed time. On the 14th day of that month at twilight, uh, they are going to, to keep the Passover at the appointed time. And so they were to to celebrate this uh, for for eight days, and they're to follow the regulations that God has laid out, um, as it says here in verse five of chapter nine, according to all the Lord commanded Moses. So the people did. Now, if you remember, there people had to prepare themselves to be clean for this, but there was a problem. What if somebody had touched a dead body? Uh, the day that they were supposed to celebrate it. Well, what were they to do? That they, they couldn't partake in that because they hadn't gone through the cleansing. And and so what ends up happening is the Lord tells Moses that uh, if, in verse number 10, if any one of you or your descendants is unclean through touching a dead body or is on a long journey, he shall still keep the Passover to the Lord. In the second month, not the first month, on the 14th day at twilight, they shall keep it. Um, in a sense, those same uh, instructions. So if one could not do it on that, that day, then they were to do it one, a month later uh, and to observe Passover then. But also there's, uh, says there's to be no excuses here for somebody to say, well, I would touch a dead body and they just don't celebrate it. Uh, that's why God says in verse 13, but if anyone who is clean and is not on a journey fails to keep the Passover, they just forget then that person shall be cut off from his people because he did not bring the Lord's offering at his appointed time. That man shall bear his sin. Um, and then it talks about a sojourner after that. But I think that's uh, important to remember here is uh, we need to be taking God's worship uh, seriously. You know, somebody to, to, not, to know Passover is a big deal and to just blatantly disregard it when everybody, all the rest of the people are celebrating it are, would to be a, a slight against God. And I think that uh, this is a reminder to us that God's worship uh, day in and day out uh, in our own life is important, but especially on Sundays as we gather together with people of God. We shouldn't neglect it. Uh, we should take it seriously. We should uh, revere it. We should uh, enjoy it 
as it reminds us of our God, who he is, what he's done, as he encourages us. And so we must take it seriously. We must take him seriously, just as uh, he is trying to show the people here. Now, if we, as we kind of wrap this up, the, the latter portion of chapter 9 uh, is a reminder that God is in control. Uh, we see here that the cloud covers the tabernacle. Um, and is, appears as fire at night. And when the cloud is picks up, it means the people are to, to head out. Um, but if the cloud remains, then the people are to stay. They don't do whatever they want to do, but they follow God's lead. As he dwells there with them, he is the one uh, that guides and directs all that they do. And this is a reminder here that the people of Israel uh, are not doing things according to their own whim, but according to what the Lord commands. Uh, again, we see that here today. We don't just do as we please, but we follow God's direction um, and, and live our lives in obedience to him. Uh, and that's why verse 22 says, whether it was two days or a month or a longer time, that the cloud continued over the tabernacle, abiding there. The people of Israel remained in camp and did not set out. But when it lifted, they set out. Here's the, here's the kicker here in verse 23. At the command of the Lord, they camped. And at the command of the Lord, they set out. They kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord by Moses. And so we see it's ultimately that they're following what God has to say. And the same thing is true for us. Is we are to, to do all that we do at the command of God, uh, not according to our own whims. Now one little snippet we get here in uh, chapter 10, verses 1 through 10. Um, God tells Moses to make two silver trumpets. Um, and these, the tabernacle is going to, excuse me, God's presence, the tabernacle lifting up as the cloud is to signify, hey, we're leaving, but they're to build these trumpets is to kind of make it organize as how they leave. The trumpet's blown, then uh, this side sets out. This trumpet's blown, the other side uh, is set out. And so to, in order so they can have a, an organized uh, procession as they pack up and they leave. And also we're told these same trumpets, um, they're going to be used in war. Uh, they're going to be used at a point of feast, at the beginning of the months, for burnt offerings and sacrifice and peace offerings. Ultimately to remind everyone that they are before the Lord, that he is the Lord their God. Uh, and so we see that these things have been fashioned here at the end. And... Um, We'll stop here today. I know we're not stopping at the end of the chapter because next week we'll find uh, the people picking up uh, and leaving Mount Sinai. Now, um, again, we don't have a strictly what about us section today. I, I kind of threw it in there, but uh, I hope that that was uh, helpful in understanding with you. I think the book of Numbers, which uh, we really don't spend much time in, uh, it's much of, there's much in there to show us. Also, I don't, know, I don't know if I forgot to mention this last week or not, but the book Numbers, if you remember, there's a census that starts uh, in the beginning of the book, and there's another census in the end, and it reminds that that's where we get the, the name Numbers. But uh, all that to say, I think that there, there's much that we can learn here. Well, I hope that was helpful for you, and I hope you are well this week. But before we end, let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you again uh, for your word and how it guides us in all ways of our life. And I pray that you would just continue to build us up uh, with a love for it and a love for you. Help us to daily dive in, uh, to be nourished by it, to be nourished by you. Lord, I pray that you would just continue to build us up as your church. Bless us through your word. And Lord, I pray that you would make us a blessing to this world. I pray in Jesus' name.